we would like to send out a special thanks to BetterHelp for supporting The Trail Went Cold. For 10% off your first month, go to betterhelp.com slash trail and start living a better life today. Enjoy the show. August 12th, 1992, Panama City, Florida. After leaving her home in Georgia on a vacation with her two children, 36-year-old Pamela June Ray arrives at a beachfront motel during the early morning hours and parks in front of the office. Pamela's children are asleep in the back seat. But when they wake up a few hours later, they learn their mother has vanished. A patrol officer reports having seen Pamela in the company of an unidentified man shortly before she went missing. Years later, a convicted murderer named Mark Reby confesses to abducting and killing Pamela, but he later recants his confession and no trace of her is ever found. After that, the trail went cold. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our latest episode of The Trail Went Cold. I'm your host, Robin Mortar, and today we're going to be exploring a frightening cold case involving a missing mother, the 1992 disappearance of Pamela June Ray. That voice you just heard narrating our intro was Dr. Ashley Wellman, the latest winner of our most recent Trail Went Cold voiceover contest. As you might know, Ashley just happens to be one of my co-hosts on my recently launched spin-off podcast, The Path Went Chilly, and in a crazy coincidence, I recently drew Ashley's name. As it turned out, she had originally entered this contest back in January of 2018, back when she was just a casual Trail Went Cold fan and we did not know each other. If you'd like to enter this contest and haven't already done so, I will be providing instructions near the end of this episode, and I will also be making brief mention of some other cold cases from Florida, which Ashley has worked on in the past. But let's start talking about today's featured case involving Pamela June Ray. It involves a mother who decided to take her two children on a vacation to Florida, but vanished from a motel parking lot shortly after she arrived, presumably after being abducted by an unidentified male. This case was once featured on an episode of Unsolved Mysteries, and in recent years, it has received coverage on the British true crime series Serial Killers with Pierce Morgan, which features an interview with a convicted murderer named Mark Reby, who once confessed to being responsible for Pamela's disappearance. Even though Reby has only been officially linked to one murder, there has been a lot of speculation that he is a serial killer who may have been responsible for the deaths of at least a dozen women, including Pamela. This episode will also contain research from the website lostandfoundblogs.com, which is run by my friend and fellow Unsolved Mysteries fan Heather Groutman, a.k.a. Crystal Dawn, who has published a pair of extensive articles about this case. Next year will officially mark the 30th anniversary of Pamela's disappearance, and even though there have been some compelling leads in the investigation, she is still a missing person, which is why we will be exploring her story on today's episode. However, before we get started, just a quick reminder that The Trail Went Cold is a weekly podcast, which is currently available for download on several platforms, including Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, and Spotify. So if you like this podcast, be sure to subscribe to it, and please leave us a rating or review on any of those sites to help spread the word. The Trail Went Cold is on Patreon, so if you would like to learn how to support the show, please visit our page at patreon.com slash thetrailwentcold. For as little as $1 a month, you can garner access to exclusive rewards, which may include stickers and thank you cards, early access to episodes, and bonus content. So with all that out of the way, let us now delve into the disappearance of Pamela June Ray. Our story begins in 1992, and our central figure is 36-year-old Pamela June Ray, who lives in Villa Rica, Georgia with her husband, Michael Ray, and their two children, 12-year-old Shane and 5-year-old Brandy. Since school is going to be starting soon, Pamela wants to take her kids on one last vacation to visit Panama City Beach, Florida, but since Michael is busy working, he will be unable to come along with them. On August the 11th, Pamela loaded her son and daughter into her blue 1991 Plymouth Sundance and went to visit her brother in the town of Luthersville. After leaving his house at around 10.30 p.m., Pamela began her 250-mile drive to Panama City Beach and would arrive during the early morning hours of August the 12th. The previous evening, Pamela had phoned the manager of the Wilhite Motel on Front Beach Road to inquire about making a reservation and was told that a room would be available at 9 or 10 a.m. When she arrived, Pamela parked her car in front of the motel's office while Shane and Brandy remained sleeping in the back seat, but shortly thereafter, she would vanish without a trace. At around 8.30 a.m., one of the motel's employees noticed that the two children were sleeping unattended inside the Plymouth Sundance and became concerned enough to contact the Panama City Beach Police Department. When police arrived at the scene, they discovered that the Sundance was locked, so they knocked on the window to wake up Shane and Brandy, who told them they had no idea where their mother was. It turned out that Pamela's keys and her purse, which contained $200 in traveler's checks, were still inside the car, and since she was known for being a very devoted mother who was protective of her children, it seemed very unlikely that she had left them alone on her own accord. 
A missing persons report would be filed for Pamela, and after the rest of her family were informed about what was happening, they traveled down to Panama City Beach to pick up the children and participated in a search for her. Front Beach Road contained a number of beachfront motels, including the Wilhite, but even though every single room was checked, it failed to turn up any trace of Pamela. Investigators would hear from multiple witnesses who recalled seeing Pamela sitting inside her Plymouth Sundance in front of the motel office at around 5 a.m. on the morning of August the 12th. However, the most interesting sighting would be from a patrol officer who was driving through the area at 525 and thought he saw Pamela standing outside her vehicle with an unidentified white male. After being placed under hypnosis, the officer recalled the white male as being around 6 feet tall and 150 pounds with light hair and light eyes and wearing a shirt which had alternating dark and light colored horizontal stripes. He saw Pamela lock her car and followed the man towards the parking lot next to the motel's swimming pool area. A few minutes after the officer drove off, some of the guests at the motel recalled hearing the sounds of a woman screaming out for help, but since the rooms there did not have phones, they were unable to call anyone for assistance. Unfortunately, the area would also be hit with a heavy rainfall during this time period, which may have washed away potential evidence. Prior to Pamela's arrival at the motel, other witnesses had also recalled seeing a man urinating in public who matched the description of the unidentified male. One month later, Police received a promising lead when a 29-year-old Panama City resident named Andrew Paul Henry was arrested for kidnapping and rape. On March the 4th of that year, a male suspect had abducted a woman outside a convenience store in the town of Chipley, located over 50 miles away. He proceeded to hit her on the head with a bottle and choke her into unconsciousness before taking her into a wooded area and raping her. Even though the perpetrator threatened to kill the woman, she managed to convince him to let her go, and she subsequently reported the crime to the police. When Henry was arrested six months later, the woman picked him out of a photo lineup but the problem is that there were some inconsistencies between Henry and the original description she provided of her attacker. For instance, she mentioned him sporting a tattoo in a spot where Henry did not have one, and described the attacker as driving a different brand car than the one Henry drove. As a result of these inconsistencies, the kidnapping and rape charges against Henry were dropped. Henry did seem to match the description of the man seen with Pamela, and there were also reports that he had been sitting in a folding chair outside the Wilhite Motel in the hours prior to Pamela's disappearance. This guy in the chair was also described as wearing a striped shirt, the same type of shirt the patrol officer had seen on the man with Pamela. Police used cadaver dogs to search the wooded area where the first female victim's attack took place, but they never found any evidence linking Henry to Pamela's case, and he has since passed away. After Pamela's father, Ralph Bennett, sent in a letter to Unsolved Mysteries asking them to feature her story, they put together a special alert segment about Pamela's disappearance, which aired in December of 1992. The case would take a surprising turn in 1998, when a convicted murderer named Mark Reby confessed to being responsible for the murders of 13 women, including Pamela. At the time, Reby had recently started serving a life sentence for another murder, which was also previously featured on Unsolved Mysteries. You might recall the minisode I released in late 2016 about the unsolved disappearance of Deborah Poe, a 26-year-old convenience store clerk who vanished while working the graveyard shift at a Circle K in Orlando on February the 4th, 1990. Deborah is still a missing person to this day, but the Unsolved Mysteries segment about her case explored the possibility that her disappearance might be connected to some other cold cases from Florida involving female convenience store clerks. Six months earlier, on August the 6th, 1989, 29-year-old Donna Callahan, who happened to be three months pregnant, vanished during the middle of her shift at a convenience store in Gulf Breeze. As the years went on, word spread that a convicted inmate named William Alex Wells, who was serving a 30-year prison sentence for armed robbery, had confessed during a prison Bible study session that he was responsible for killing Donna Callahan. After building up a case against Wells, investigators eventually indicted him for Donna's murder, but in July of 1996, just as his trial was set to begin, Wells confessed that both he and his half-brother, Mark Reby, were responsible for the crime. According to Wells, as he was driving away from the convenience store following Donna's abduction, Reby strangled her to death in the back seat before her body was placed inside the trunk. They then proceeded to bury her in a wooded area in Walton County, located just 350 yards from their childhood home. Wells passed a polygraph when he shared this story, before leading investigators to Donna's remains, and just under one year later, Reby would also be charged for his role in the crime. In order to avoid the death penalty, both men agreed to plead no contest to first-degree murder, with Wells receiving two life sentences without the possibility of parole, while Reby received a sentence of 25 years to life. But like I just mentioned, shortly after he was sent to prison, Reby started confessing to a number of other unsolved cold cases from Florida, including the disappearance of Pamela June Ray. In 1992, Reby was married to his fourth wife and living in the town of Shalimar. According to Reby, they both decided to go out partying at a club in Panama City Beach, but after running out of money during the early morning hours, they started driving around in their red Pontiac Firebird looking for someone to rob. While cruising down Front Beach Road, Reby saw Pamela's Plymouth Sundance parked at the Wilhite Motel, and after noticing that it had out-of-state tags, he told his wife to pull over. He then proceeded to abduct Pamela at knife point before placing her inside his Firebird and fleeing the scene. 
Reby then claimed that he murdered Pamela, but he would provide two different accounts of how he disposed of her body, at first claiming that he buried her in Walton County, until he revised his story and said he dumped Pamela in the ocean. Reby's story seemed to match the account of the patrol officer, who saw Pamela following another man, and Reby also mentioned that she let out a scream for help when he pulled a knife on her, which had been reported by other guests at the motel. When asked to provide a detail that only the perpetrator would have known, Reby stated that Pamela had been carrying a single key in her hand, a detail which seemed to be accurate, as Pamela had been seen locking the car door, and the rest of her keys were found inside the vehicle. However, Reby would eventually recant his confession, not only denying any involvement in Pamela's disappearance, but to the other dozen murders he admitted to. In spite of this, in April of 2000, a search was conducted of the wooded area in Walton County where Donna Callahan's remains were found, and some skeletal remains would be discovered just 100 yards away from the location where Donna had been buried. They were sent to Canada for further DNA and forensic testing, and it's unclear what happened next, but here's the complication. The remains were discovered by a Doberman pincher named Eagle, who had been trained by his notorious handler, Sandra Anderson. I already discussed this saga on the episode I released last year about the disappearance of Charita Thomas, but long story short, Eagle supposedly had a talent for sniffing out human remains, and they even produced a segment about his unique gift on Unsolved Mysteries. But the problem is that Sandra Anderson was a complete fraud, who would steal human bones from a medical examiner's office and plant them for her dog to quote-unquote discover during police searches. Anderson wound up receiving a 21-month prison sentence for this, and while it's never been officially confirmed that she planted any remains during the search for Pamela, it would not surprise me if this is the reason there has been no follow-up news about this. In recent years, there has been a renewed interest in this case, thanks to an unusual story which was shared by Mark Reby's daughter, Jelena Hayes. Jelena has developed a close friendship with Pamela's sister, Rhonda Bishop, and wants to help her solve this case. When Jelena was four years old, her father was being investigated for Donna Callahan's disappearance, and an excavation was being performed on her family's property to search for Donna's remains. While all this was going on, Jelena claimed that her father made the abrupt decision to pack up all their belongings into a pair of U-Haul trucks in the middle of the night and move the entire family away. They would travel all the way to Warrensburg, Illinois, and during the trip, Jelena noticed that some garbage bins had been loaded into one of the trucks, and her father told her not to go near them. After they arrived at some property in Warrensburg, which belonged to the sister of Reeby's wife, he instructed Jelena and her siblings to dig up some large holes, which he said would be used for a garden. The children did as instructed, but afterward, Reeby removed some garbage bags from the aforementioned bins and buried them in the holes. Jelena now fears that the bags may have contained the remains of some of her father's victims, including Pamela. By the time Jelena shared this story, the property had new owners, but they gave the Macon County Sheriff's Office permission to perform a search of the property in July of 2019. However, after spending an entire day performing an excavation, they were unable to find anything. Around this time period, Jelena would also uncover a photograph of her mother wearing a ring, which Rhonda Bishop believes is the same ring her sister had been wearing at the time she went missing. Ever since Reeby confessed to Pamela's murder, Rhonda has written him five letters in prison to ask if he killed her sister, but while Reeby has always responded, he has never actually answered the question. His letters are usually filled with ramblings, and he has refused to meet Rhonda in person. At the moment, Mark Reeby is still considered to be a suspect in Pamela's disappearance, but no evidence has ever conclusively linked him to the crime, and she continues to remain a missing person. So I guess you could say, the trail went cold. But before we continue, I would like to take a few moments to talk about our sponsor, BetterHelp. Whenever your mental health isn't doing well, you may find yourself asking, what is interfering with my happiness and preventing me from achieving my goals? Well, if you need to talk to someone about this, that's where BetterHelp comes in, as it assesses your needs and matches you with your own licensed therapist. In less than 48 hours, you can start communicating with each other in your own convenient, safe, and private online environment. You don't even have to leave your home or sit in an uncomfortable waiting room. BetterHelp is very committed to facilitating great therapeutic matches, but if by chance you want to change counselors, BetterHelp will do so for free and quite easily. It's also more affordable than traditional offline counseling, and financial aid is available if necessary. BetterHelp is not a crisis line, it's professional counseling, and you will get timely and thoughtful responses if you use their service. You can also schedule weekly video or phone sessions and send a message to your counselor at any time. So start living a happier life today. Get 10% off your first month at BetterHelp.com trail. Join over 1 million people who have taken charge of their mental health. That's BetterHelp.com slash trail for 10% off your first month. Thanks, BetterHelp. Enjoy the rest of this episode. Now, even though this case has still never been solved, for reasons unknown, the original Unsolved Mystery segment is currently not available for viewing on their official FilmRise channel on Amazon Prime and YouTube. And that's a major shame, since we've had significant developments in recent years, which may be pulling this case ever so closer to a resolution. Since it originally aired only four months after Pamela went missing, 
Unsolved Mysteries covered this story as a shorter, four-minute special alert segment, but it really resonated with viewers, who still remember it today. What was particularly scary is that Pamela was seemingly abducted a short distance away from her children, who managed to sleep through the whole thing, and it seems likely that a patrol officer just happened to see Pamela in the company of the man who abducted her. If that officer had passed through the area only a few moments later, then this case might have turned out differently. Back in 2010, Pamela's daughter Brandy made an appearance in a thread about this case at the Unsolved Mysteries message board I'm always referencing from the sitcom's online forum. She left a few comments under the username, Brandy Ray, and of course, given that she was only five years old at the time her mother went missing, she does not remember much other than being woken up that morning by the police. During my intro, I mentioned that a pair of extensive articles about this case were published at the website lostandfoundblogs.com, and the writer, Heather Groutman, used to moderate the Unsolved Mysteries message board under the name Crystal Dawn. One of the articles focuses on Pamela's disappearance, while the other focuses on the background of the prime suspect, Mark Reby. As part of her research, Heather was able to speak with Pamela's sister, Rhonda, as well as a retired special agent from the Florida Department of Law Enforcement named Dennis Haley. After he was sent to prison, Reby had personally requested to speak with Haley before he confessed to the murders of over a dozen women. I'll talk more about this momentarily, but first, I need to discuss an issue which was going on in Pamela's personal life at the time she went missing. While I don't believe this issue had any connection to Pamela's disappearance, it's frequently mentioned in a lot of the reporting about this case, so I feel that I need to address it. In 1989, a bank clerk accidentally wired around $400,000 to an account which belonged to the family's trucking company. At the time, Pamela's father, Ralph Bennett, was owed money by the government for work his company had performed for them, so rather than inform the bank about their error, he let the money sit in his account for a while before he convinced himself it was for him. Ralph decided to use the money to purchase a condominium in Panama City Beach, but when the mistake was eventually discovered, Ralph would be charged with theft of mislaid property. Ralph agreed to plead guilty to the offense in exchange for a sentence of 10 years probation, though one of the conditions was that he had to pay back all the money. After making consistent payments for a while, Ralph began to fall behind, and since he still owed $100,000, the district attorney's office became frustrated by the lack of progress. In response, they decided to indict the rest of Ralph's family, including Pamela, for bank fraud, since they were all listed as co-owners of his trucking company. This occurred a short time before Pamela left on her vacation, and she was technically out on bond at that time, but in spite of the fact that the money had once been used to buy a condo in Panama City Beach, investigators ultimately determined that these legal issues had no connection to her disappearance, and the family eventually had their records expunged. It's nothing more than an unfortunate coincidence that Pamela just happened to go missing in Panama City Beach while all this was going on, as the circumstances clearly seemed to indicate that she was a random victim who was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Whatever legal problems Ralph Bennett might have faced for spending this money, that doesn't change the fact that he was a tireless advocate for her daughter, who made countless trips from Georgia to Panama City Beach to hand out missing persons flyers and spread awareness about the case. But Ralph also had to endure a pretty painful experience when he went to visit Mark Reby's mother during the spring of 1999. By this point, Reby had already confessed his involvement in Pamela's disappearance, and he just happened to phone his mother from prison while Ralph was there. She demanded that her son speak with Ralph, and when Ralph got on the phone, Reby actually told him that he killed his daughter. Hearing this caused Ralph to drop to the floor in a state of shock, and he would succumb to a fatal heart attack just a few months later. The fact that Reby said this to a victim's father, and has since gone on to recant his confession to Pamela's murder, leaving everyone uncertain about whether or not he actually did it, comes across as particularly cruel. If this case has a bright spot, is that Mark Reby's family have developed a close relationship with Pamela's family, as the majority of Reby's relatives are sympathetic towards their situation, and have condemned his actions, and they want him to come clean, and reveal the truth about everything he did. Officially, Reby has only been charged and convicted of the murder of Donna Callahan, but there's some people who believe that he might be a full-fledged serial killer who has killed as many as 13 women. But not only has Reby recanted all the confessions he made to those murders, he now even denies responsibility for the death of Donna Callahan. Even though his half-brother, William Alex Wells, has always maintained that Reby was the one who went through the act of strangling Donna to death, Reby claims that it was Wells who actually killed her. In 2017, Reby agreed to be interviewed on the debut episode of the British true crime TV series Serial Killers with Piers Morgan and you can currently watch this series on Netflix. Reby claims that the reason he falsely confessed to all these murders was because he had made an arrangement with law enforcement to quote-unquote protect his son, and he decided to recant when they reneged on their deal. But when Pierce Morgan kept pressing him about the issue, Reby decided to walk out of the interview. These confessions were originally obtained by Florida Department of Law Enforcement Special Agent Dennis Haley, who has been investigating Reby for over two decades. While Haley personally believes that some of the confessions Reby made were false, he does suspect him of being responsible for at least seven murders, including that of Pamela June Ray, because in some of these confessions, Reby supposedly shared details that only the killer could have known. For instance, Reby said that Pamela was only carrying a single key when he abducted her, a detail which seems to be supported by the fact 
that all of Kamala's keys but one were found inside her vehicle. If you want to learn more about the other crimes Reby is alleged to have been involved in, I'd recommend checking out the article, Mark Reby, Sins of the Father, published at lostandfoundblogs.com, though I'll be discussing one of these cases momentarily. But before we talk any more about Reby, I want to briefly discuss the other potential suspect that popped up on the radar during the early stages of the investigation, Andrew Paul Henry, who allegedly kidnapped and raped another woman in Florida five months earlier, though those charges were later dropped. When this previous crime was committed, the perpetrator apparently told the victim he would kill her, but she somehow convinced him to let her go. So if Henry was the abductor, and he decided to do the same thing to Pamela, then I can see him not wanting to run the risk of letting her go this time around. Even though this other crime took place in Chipley, Henry lived in Panama City, and a man matching his description was apparently seen sitting outside the Wilhite Motel in the hours prior to Pamela's disappearance. There otherwise isn't much information available about Henry, though at the time he was charged with the attack in Chipley, he was already facing charges for violating a pretrial release agreement by allegedly battering his wife, so it does not sound like he was a model citizen. If Henry did abduct Pamela, then there's not much else that can be done since he's currently deceased, but in the grand scheme of things, Mark Reby definitely seems like the more promising suspect. We know that the passing patrol officer saw Pamela's likely abductor, but it sounds like he was too far away to get a good enough look in order to positively identify him as Henry, Reby, or anyone else. I know that Reby specifically mentioned that he and his wife were driving a red Pontiac Firebird, but he said that she parked it near the back of the building when he approached Pamela, so the vehicle may have been out of the officer's line of sight. And incidentally, this Firebird was never seized by law enforcement, and its current whereabouts are unknown. The way the Wilhite Motel was laid out is that the office Pamela parked in front of was located separately from the rooms next to the main parking lot. According to the officer, Pamela locked her car before following the man in that direction, so it makes sense that he would have used this opportunity to abduct Pamela and force her into another vehicle before fleeing the scene. You have to wonder what the man could have said to Pamela to convince her to follow him, but perhaps he was pretending to be an employee and told Pamela he had a room ready that he wanted to show her. Reeby's story is that he selected Pamela at random because he wanted to rob someone, but if he is telling the truth, the ironic thing is that she left her purse inside her vehicle. However, since there is a photograph of Reeby's wife wearing what appears to be Pamela's ring, it's possible this is the only thing they stole from her. Now, I mentioned earlier that the one victim we know that Reeby murdered, Donna Callahan, was briefly mentioned during the Unsolved Mystery segment about the 1990 disappearance of convenience store clerk Deborah Poe, who has still not been found to this day. Well, believe it or not, even though Reeby never confessed to Deborah's murder, Dennis Haley believes that he might also be involved in that crime. If you recall the details of the case, shortly before Deborah was reported missing, a customer reported walking into the store and seeing an unidentified man behind the counter who sold her a pack of cigarettes. Since he was wearing a t-shirt for the heavy metal band Megadeth and has never been identified, Unsolved Mysteries fans have nicknamed him Megadeth Guy. Well, according to Dennis Haley, this witness later looked at a photo lineup and picked out Reeby's half-brother, William Alex Wells, his accomplice when they murdered Donna Callahan. I have to admit that I was a bit skeptical about this, since Wells does not match the description of Megadeth Guy at all. The aforementioned Sins of a Father article, published at lostandfoundblogs.com, has published excerpts of some emails Wells has sent to Rhonda in recent years, and he denies any involvement in Deborah Poe's disappearance, stating, quote, I've spoken several times with investigators concerning the Deborah Poe case, and I'll tell you the same thing I've told them. Not only was I on house arrest in Walton County, where my every move was monitored by probation and parole, tax records and business records will show that I have never been employed in Orange County. Even though my picture was picked in a photo pack that is designed to get certain people picked, the investigators knew it was impossible for me to have been in Orlando during that time, end quote. Well, if that's true, then it's unlikely Wells was involved in Deborah's disappearance, but what's particularly interesting is that Reby initially attempted to implicate Wells in Pamela June Ray's murder. As an example, Reby once shared a story with Agent Haley about having followed Wells into the woods, where he watched him dig up the bodies of Donna Callahan and Pamela June Ray before moving them to another location. But we know this story cannot be true, since Wells was already in prison for another crime when Pamela went missing in August of 1992, and at no point would he have ever been in any position to dig up her body. So this is why Haley suspects that Reby may have been using Wells as a surrogate in his confessions by falsely claiming he had witnessed Wells do things that he himself had done. Wells has also provided an interesting story which seems to implicate his half-brother in Pamela's case. In 1993, when they were both being investigated for Donna Callahan's disappearance, Reby went to visit Wells in prison, where he allegedly told him that he had paid a visit to the wooded area where Donna's remains were buried, but he decided to leave them there because he believed police would never find her. However, Reby then made a statement about how he, quote-unquote, had to move the other lady, and when Wells asked who he was referring to, he replied, quote, the one from Panama City with the kids. Well, Reby's statement about leaving Donna's remains where they were did ring true, because when Wells led the authorities to her body years later, 
the original burial site had not been tampered with, meaning she was never moved from that spot since 1989. Wells also claims that on the same day Reeby visited him in prison, he had gone to a woman's house and asked to use her shower because he was very sweaty and dirty. Reeby told the woman he had been helping someone work on a transmission, but she said it looked like he had dirt on him, not oil or transmission fluid. So could this mean Reeby dug up Pamela from the location he originally buried her and moved her remains to another location? Well, remember, when he confessed to Pamela's murder, Reeby changed his original story about what he did with her body, at first claiming that he buried her before he said he dumped her in the ocean. This theory also takes on greater significance when you remember the story from Reeby's daughter, Jelena, about him moving the family to Illinois and having his children dig some holes in order to bury some garbage bags. Indeed, if those bags just contained your ordinary run-of-the-mill trash, I'm not sure why Reeby would bother taking them on an 800-mile trip and go to the trouble of burying them rather than just dumping them somewhere. Years ago, Jelena's two siblings spoke to Rhonda and confirmed that they remembered this incident having taken place. While a recent search of the property where these bags were buried turned up nothing, it's worth mentioning that the Macon County Sheriff's Department's funds for this were very limited. They were only able to spend one day digging up a small area on a large piece of property, so that doesn't necessarily mean there isn't anything there, and they have talked about performing further searches when it's viable. It's unsettling to think about the possibility that Pamela's remains are buried on that property several states from where she originally went missing from, but you also have to consider the fact that most of the murders Reby is suspected of being responsible for are not missing persons cases. So could those bags have contained the remains of other missing victims we don't even know about? I guess the real wild card in this case is Reby's wife, whom he claims was present in their Pontiac Firebird when he abducted and murdered Pamela. There really isn't all that much information available about her, so I have no idea how thoroughly she has been investigated. But during his email exchanges with Rhonda, Wells stated that even though there has never been any evidence to prove that Reby's wife was complicit in any of his crimes, he does think it's possible she could have been a participant. The best way to describe Mark Reby is that he's a major enigma, because while he's technically only been convicted of one murder, he could potentially be one of the worst serial killers in the history of the United States. But as I'm sure you're well aware, it's not uncommon for convicted murderers who have nothing left to lose to play games with the authorities for the fun of it. Like I mentioned earlier, Reby spoke to the father of a missing woman on the phone and told him he had murdered his daughter, but then he decided to recant his confession and deny any involvement. That's an incredibly manipulative thing to do, and Reby has since done the same thing to the families of the other women he confessed to murdering before he recanted. I know that Reby threw a fit and walked out of that interview with Pierce Morgan, but making himself look like the victim is part of his M.O., so you get the sense that he was getting off on the fact that a famous British media personality wanted to interview him for a TV series about serial killers. If Reby was responsible for what happened to Pamela, then I have my doubts that he will truly come clean and reveal where her remains are, and if this case is solved, it will probably be through some other means. But thankfully, it sounds like investigators are still actively working on it, and Pamela has not been forgotten. So if you happen to have any information about the unsolved disappearance of Pamela June Ray, please contact the Panama City Beach Police Department at 850-233-5000. That's 850-233-5000. Anyway, another special thanks to Dr. Ashley Wellman for narrating the opening of today's episode. If you've already entered our listener voiceover contest before, you are automatically eligible for a next random drawing, so you don't have to do anything. But if you would like to enter and haven't done so yet, just send me an email under the subject line, Trail and Cold Contest, naming the one unsolved cold case you would most like to see covered on this podcast. So once again, send me an email under the subject line, Trail and Cold Contest, to robin.warder at icloud.com. That's robin.warder at icloud.com. So like I mentioned during the intro, along with Dr. Jules from the Riddle Me That podcast, Ashley Wellman is one of the co-hosts of my recently launched spin-off podcast, The Path Went Chili, in which the three of us have had in-depth discussions about unsolved cold cases I previously covered on the Trail and Cold. Thus far, we've released episodes on the Blair Adams, Keith Warren, and Ray Rivera cases, and there's plenty more to come, so if you haven't listened to The Path Went Chilly yet, I highly recommend you check it out. Also, being a criminologist, Ashley once did some work for the Alachua County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Unit in Gainesville, Florida, and when she originally entered my contest back in January of 2018, she listed three of their active cold cases, and I'm going to briefly share some details about them to help get the word out. Our first victim is 23-year-old Michael Shane Crutchfield, who was found shot to death in his apartment doorway at the Hickory Hills Apartments at approximately 11 p.m. on the evening of May the 13th, 1999. A light-colored sedan was seen leaving the area, containing at least one unknown male suspect, but the shooting remains unsolved. Our second victim is 34-year-old Wendy Ellinger, who was found dead shortly after midnight on March the 18th, 2005. Wendy lived in a double-wide mobile home at the Canifa Highland subdivisions, but after the residence caught fire, her body would be discovered at the scene. Wendy was the divorced mother of three children, though thankfully, none of them were present when the fire took place. The investigation soon revealed that Wendy had sustained injuries before the fire even started, so her death was officially classified as a homicide. 
Our third victim is 24-year-old Robert Howard, who was reported missing from Gainesville's Arredondo Farms area on August the 5th, 1992. He remained missing for 20 months until his skeletal remains were discovered in a wooded area off Archer Road and Southwest 170th Street on April the 18th, 1994. Due to injuries that were discovered during his autopsy, Robert's death was ruled to be a homicide. So if you happen to have any information about the unsolved murders of Michael Shane Crutchfield, Wendy Ellinger, or Robert Howard, please contact the Alachua County Sheriff's Office Cold Case Unit at 352-384-3323. That's 352-384-3323. Now the reminder that The Trail Went Cold is on Patreon, so please visit patreon.com slash thetrailwentcold to learn how you can support our podcast and become eligible for some pretty neat rewards. We produced a bunch of exclusive bonus episodes for our patrons in tiers 2 and 3, and this past month, I released an episode which covered two cases from Unsolved Mysteries involving young women who were supposedly afflicted with amnesia after surviving a violent attack. The stories of Kyra Cook and Sarah Powell. And for our patrons in Tier 3, I've also recorded another new audio commentary track which can be played over a classic episode of Unsolved Mysteries. I'd also like to give a shout out to our most recent listeners who have signed up with us on Patreon this week, and they are Mandy O, N, John W, Alyssa P, and Emily. Thank you all so much for your support. And before I bring this episode to a close, I'd like to play a promo for another true crime podcast. Disturbed True Horror Stories. Derek's face was stony and etched with rage as he sat in the dark cab staring at my house. As they described it, the police found his blog where he wrote about his obsession with one of the girls who lived next door. The most disturbing true tales of terror. I could kill you right now if I wanted to. No one would ever find you. Israel Keys, most known for murdering an underage girl in Alaska, dismembering her body and dropping the pieces into a frozen lake. Featuring narrations by the best in the business. She grabbed me by the throat and by my hair and pushed me under the water again. I can honestly say I have never been so scared in my life. I'm your host, Chad. Join me every Thursday on Disturbed True Horror Stories in your favorite podcast app or online at disturbedpodcast.com for the most immersive true horror experience. I'd also like to mention that later this year, provided that it becomes safe to travel again, The Trail in Cold is going to be appearing on Podcast Row at the very first CrimeCon UK, which is being held at the Leonardo Royal Hotel and Spa in London. I'd previously stated that CrimeCon UK was set to take place on the weekend of June 12th and the 13th, but due to restrictions, they have now decided to postpone it until the weekend of September the 25th and 26th, so fingers crossed that it will still happen as planned. If you would like to purchase tickets to either event, we have a special promo code you can use to get a 10% discount. So to receive 10% off, visit crimecon.co.uk and enter the promo code COAL21. That's COAL21. I also wanted to mention that this coming Thursday, April the 22nd, I will be appearing on a live stream for the Lombard Historical Society in Lombard, Illinois, where I will deliver a virtual presentation about the 1966 disappearance of the Indiana Dunes women, a case I covered on the Trail Went Cold last year. The event runs from 7 until 8 p.m. Central Time, which is 8 until 9 p.m. Eastern Time, and to learn more about the presentation and register for it, please visit the website lombardhistory.org. That's L-O-M-B-A-R-D history.org. And you can also find a link to this event in our show notes or pinned to the top of our podcast Facebook and Twitter pages. Once again, that's this coming Thursday, April the 22nd, from 7 until 8 p.m. Central Time. I just wanted to give another shout out to my supporters at the Unresolved Mysteries subreddit and the Unsolved Mysteries message board at the Sitcoms Online forum, which has some interesting threads about the Pamela June Ray case. And of course, I'd also like to provide another special thanks to lostandfoundblogs.com, which not only features extensive articles about Pamela June Ray's disappearance, but a number of other cases from Unsolved Mysteries. I need to provide a big thanks to Miguel Foote, who edits and assembles this podcast together for me, and Vince Nitro, who composes the eerie music you hear on every episode. If you haven't already, you can like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, or leave us a rating or review on Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Podcasts, or Spotify. So have yourself a good week, and join us next Wednesday for another brand new episode of The Trail Went Cold. Thank you.